Pirelli World Challenge has made 13 previous visits to Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin's Road America, but the last was 2009. It is an absence that has been felt bitterly by the fans, by the competitors in general, but perhaps no more so than by the drivers themselves. This is America's Nürburgring. This is America's National Park of Speed. It is a remarkable venue, and the Pirelli World Challenge is back. It's time for round seven and eight of the GT and GTS championships. Hi everybody and welcome to the Standing Start, the Pirelli World Challenge pre-race show as we get ready for the Cadillac Grand Prix of Road America and round number eight of the Pirelli World Challenge GT and GTS Championships. I'm Greg Creamer. this is Jeff Lepper. We're in the Recaro Fan Zone where yesterday we saw an amazing autograph session unfold here at Road America. And I think a large part of that, Jeff, is that as I mentioned in the very top of this show, it has been since 2009 that the Pirelli World Challenge has raced at one of North America's legendary venues Long overdue, the fans love and we're back. Well, you know, people have bucket list items to go do. Drivers have bucket list track. This is a bucket list track to go to, I think, for any driver worldwide, not just in America. Without a doubt, it's immensely challenging running up and over the glacial moraines and the Kettle Moraine Forest carved by the glaciers so many millions of years ago. It is a remarkable venue at some four miles in length. We've got other great news. In GT, Dyson Racing, Team Bentley is making their debut in the Pirelli World Challenge with the amazing Bentley Continental GT3R, Jeff. Huge news. Oh, it is. And Butch Leitzinger coming to the ah. series as well. How about that? We'll see Guy Smith and Chris Dyson a little bit later in a second car. But to have a mark like Bentley come into the Pirelli World Challenge worldwide, they came off a victory at Silverstone in the Block Pond Endurance Series, come here at Pirelli World Challenge on a Sprint Series. It's going to be so exciting to see that car race. There's no question of that. And of course, D uh, Butch Leitzinger, one of the guys who was called a Bentley boy when he ran with the Bentley Speed 8s at Le Mans over a decade ago. Great to have them back and racing. And of course, Dyson Racing, one of the legendary teams in North American motorsport for some 30 years now, have them as part of the Pirelli World Challenge. That's absolutely massive. But we also have GTS. And you know, this is a track, Jeff. It's got three very long, fast sections. It is a combination of balance, the compromise, however you want to put it, of straight line speed and getting through these long corners fast. These long straights. Horsepower is key, and in the GTS class, not quite as powerful as GT, so any horsepower advantage is huge. That's going to play a big role here, I think. Oh, it will, and when you think about horsepower, you're thinking Mustang, Camaro, Monster V8s, the Aston Martin V8 in that car. But, you know, top of the time charts and has been fast all weekend long is the Kias, the four-cylinder yeah. turbocharged. Still monster power, monster torque, great handling. They got the whole package. It's a toss-up in GTS. It truly is. And of course, that's one of the big stories. The Kias also have to work on keeping the front wheel drive. They're the only front wheel drive car in the class, keeping those tires alive in the front of the car through these long duration high speed corners. But as you alluded to, they're always very, very good when it comes to handling well, as Dorsey Schrader would say, handling well in a straight line. <laughs> and we decided we needed to find out why. What's the magic there? So a bit earlier, we checked in with their head of engine development, Ed Semph. I'm Ed Semph. Uh, I work as a calibration engineer uh, and engine development in powertrain development for the Kia Optima. For the Pirelli World Challenge Kia Optima, we start with the factory engine. We utilize a lot of the factory components. Like many uh, current road car engines, it utilizes gasoline direct injection for a high level of efficiency. It uses a turbocharger and it uses variable valve timing on both the intake and exhaust camshafts. In the Pirelli World Challenge Series, we race against a wide variety of cars, Camaros, Mustangs, Porsches. Our engine package is, is definitely at a, in, at a disadvantage just from a displacement uh, standpoint. However, the technology involved in the Kia Optima helps us compete with a very large displacement engine. So they have a very large torque number, for instance, but we have a higher revving engine that makes more horsepower uh, per liter. Uh, so we can close that gap between large displacement engines with our technology. Well, they really are doing some amazing things with that Kia team on so many different levels. Not only is it showing on the time charts here, but in the points. Oh, it really is, you know, right at the top of the charts there, and it's going to get to see and the development they've done on that car, you know, not your average race sedan, that's for sure. Oh boy, absolutely <laughs> no way. Well, we're going to step away for just a minute, but when we come back, we're going to go back to the GT category and that great story of Bentley's appearance here in the Pirelli World Challenge with Dyson Racing. We have a special guest coming your way. Don't go anywhere. 
This Pirelli World Challenge broadcast is being brought to you by the Cadillac V-Series, the 556-horsepower CTSV coupe sedan and wagon, the world's fastest family of cars. By StopTech, championship-winning brake components and systems for racing cars and high-performance vehicles on the street or track. StopTech, brake late, finish first. The Wright brothers started in a garage. Mattel started in a garage. Disney started in a garage. Amazon started in a garage. The Ramones started in a garage. My point? Some of the most innovative things in the world come out of American garages. Introducing the lighter, faster Cadillac CTS, 2014 Motor Trend Car of the Year. Ain't garages great? This is how racing should be. The top sports car racers in North America. 50-minute Jordan Moore all-out sprint races. Standing starts and zero scheduled pit stops. A battle of the brands with over 18 manufacturer brands racing. Watch us on the NBC Sports Network and online at world-challengetv.com. The Pirelli World Challenge. This is how racing should be. Thanks for joining us back here in the Recaro Fan Zone. We've said it before about Road America, there are some awesome places to watch, but the best seats in the house, they're all in this little room right here, the Recaro seats. They are something very special, whether you race or in your passenger car, safety, comfort, unparalleled. It's the standing start as we continue our pre-race show here as we get ready for more racing in GT and GTS. And as we promised you, Jeff, we've got a very special guest. We talked about the return of Dyson Racing to racing this season and bringing the prestige, the luxury, the now performance of Bentley with Dyson Racing Team Bentley. Please welcome Chris Dyson, sporting director and also an awfully good driver behind the wheel of the car. Big week for you, obviously, having run at Le Mans where one of your co-drivers set a record as the youngest driver ever to run. And now you come here with this debut of this amazing program and World Challenge. First of all, welcome, Chris. It's amazing to have this team and this car here. Well, Greg, I got to tell you, we can't be happier to be here in Pirelli World Challenge with, uh, with Team Bentley. And uh, we're just so thrilled with the partnership. And everyone's been very receptive. And the car seems to perform really well in the first couple of outings. Uh, you know, it's early days, but we're looking forward to starting here strongly and, and uh, you know, ending up the season on a strong footing as we head into 2015. Got to ask you, obviously, Dyson Racing for 30 years has been a benchmark in North American motorsports and the like. So many options, I'm sure, available for you, yet you chose the Pirelli World Challenge. Why? Well, strategically, you know, we were looking for a long-term partner, and, and right now GT3 Racing Worldwide seems to be a great platform um, with a lot of headroom and, and a lot of investment. And, um, you know, we had some existing relationships with, uh, with Ben um, uh, and we really thought, okay, let's try to leverage as much as we can for Bentley as a brand. Yeah. But uh, as far as technically speaking, the GT3 platform is really the same as what they're running in the, the FIA Blank Pond series. So, you know, it, it's a good fit for them technically and for us to have uh, some, some good two-way feedback with the factory uh, and representing them on a work-supported basis here just created some commercial opportunities for the team that were too good to, 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 turn, uh, to turn away. And uh, I guess you can say that the partnership really was, was truly a great fit from the start. Well, we're sure lucky to have them, Jeff. Yeah, we sure are. We're lucky to have some of the great driver lineups you're gonna have. We'll see a second car a little bit later. Tell us about you know the legendary drivers we're gonna have in these Bentleys. Well, we've got Butch Leitzinger, who obviously is a Bentley boy from uh, the early 2000s, uh, Le Mans podium finisher with Bentley. Uh, you know, Butch has been with the, with the team for uh, going on 20 years, which is quite amazing when you think about it. But he's still as fast as ever and uh, a savvy, savvy racer and, uh, you know, hugely experienced in the GT cars. Um, Guy Smith and myself will, will be splitting uh, the remaining parts of the schedule when we have our second car. Uh, which we expect to have out soon. Uh, guys obviously needs no introduction, but uh, you know has been has been spearheading the effort in uh, in Europe. They won their their first race at Silverstone, and and uh, we're looking forward to having him back here on American soil. So that's going to be exciting there. And long term goals for the Bentley in Pro World Challenge North America racing. Well, I mean, it's uh, the short term is to establish the the, the program here. Uh, longer term is to put ourselves in a position where we can contend for race wins and and uh, mount a serious effort for the championship next year. Boy, are we looking forward to that. Oh, and you know, the first thing though, is you gotta get through the weekend yeah. on one of the most challenging courses in North America, Road America. And now it's time for you to get a tour of the track from one of the drivers with one of the teams of some of the most experienced in World Challenge at this track, Cadillac, for the Cadillac CTSV Key Corners. Here's Andy Pilgrim. I'm Andy Pilgrim, and this is gonna be your Cadillac Key Corners from Road America. 
Long front straightaway, coming up to turn one, a right-hander for us, fourth gear right-hander, breaking right at that road right there. It's a very flat corner here, nice and smooth, a little bumps out there. You can use the curves on the outside. This, they call this two, but this little kink, down to three, right-hander. Again, third gear through here, and then we've got another massive long straightaway. Road America is really a, a tremendous road course. Reminds me a lot of Spa in Belgium. It's an amazing place. Got some really high speeds, great stuff. Now you've got a little bit of a, a turn to the left and then your braking zone is downhill into turn five. Right down there, very, very hard braking. Second gear, round turn five, coming up at the hill now. This is a almost a vertical brake area. You're braking in here, you're trying to get the car to turn very, very slippery through turn six. And then you've got a quick left right here. This is the right part of it, turn seven trying to use the curbs on the outside you've got to carry a lot of speed through there coming downhill here to turn eight heavy braking down here again the brakes really take a battering at road america now we're coming into the infamous carousel which we really is two turns nine and turn ten coming into turn nine this is the top part of the carousel and then it starts to drop away here and this is now we're in turn ten apex of ten come out of there at really high speed coming into the famous kink which is turn eleven we just breathe off the gas through here we're just crazy speeds through here wonderful wonderful racetrack and you're coming down like to grandma's house down to canada corner turn twelve really flying through here heavy heavy braking down to third gear right hander little bit of elevation change coming out of here car wants to slide out there and then you've got uphill towards 13 a great left hand totally blind left hand kink over the top of the hill through to turn 14 which is the final turn here you really need a good exit out of 14 to get up the hill and it's towards the start and finish straight away it's a long way up this hill you feel it coming up we're coming over the top of the hill and then you get to the start and finish line eventually and that is your Cadillac Key Corners from Road America. Wow, I mean really the only way to describe this track, Jeff, special. Oh, it really is so special that I totaled my car here in the only race I ever did and I would give vital parts of my anatomy to race again. <laughs> well, that's a hook right there, no question about it. Well, it's time for us to go racing. It is time for round eight, once again, of the GT and GTS Rally World Challenge Championships, the Cadillac Grand Prix of Road America. You're going to head up to the booth. I'm heading to the front of the grid to do a little pre-race activities. When we come back, Rally World Challenge is going racing again at Road America. And I'd love to be able to say that. Revs coming up. We're green! Big boom coming off the three. Two, three, four abreast in some spots. Side-by-side -side action. He absolutely nailed it. Three-way battle. And we've got an incident. You would expect nothing less. Oh, oh. clips the inside apex. Very racy. This is going to get into That Look is a brave this. move. What a pop. This is what World Challenge is all about. Well, welcome to the Pirelli World Challenge round number eight of the GT, GTA, and GTS category, all part of the Cadillac Grand Prix at Sonoma. We want to welcome all of our worldwide web, worldwide web viewers. There we go. Say that quick at worldchallengetv.com. I'm Jeff Lepper. Greg Creamer just gave our command to start engines from Jim Verpelat, the global marketing director of Cadillac. He gave a great command to start engines, and guys are on their formation lap. You see that Cadillac CTSV pace car, our official pace car for the Pirelli World Challenge, leading this field of 42 GT, GTA, and GTS cars around, all part of the Cadillac Grand Prix of Sonoma. Round number eight yesterday was a great run. See our GTS field warming up those Pirelli P0 slicks and right in the background following this field of 42 machines is that Cadillac Escalade safety vehicle. Cadillac, all the things they do for the Pirelli World Challenge, they do provide our Cadillac CTSV pace car and our official safety vehicle. Dick Lubatina driving that today and it's one of those things that it's better to have it and not need it than it is to need it and not have it. We appreciate all the things that our safety vehicle does here they do around that first lap but how about the grid here we'll go through the top five of our starting order on each of our field here starting with your pole sitter and race winner yesterday mike skeen that hot performance audi r8 ultra from crp racing outside of row number one overall what a great story here you see it on your screen that beautiful Bentley Continental GT3 from Dyson Racing and no less than Butch Lightsinger himself behind the wheel. Starting in third place, it's Nick Mancuso from Chicago, Illinois. Considers this his home racetrack and then R. Ferry Motorsports Ferrari 458 GT3. 
Next to him, Johnny O'Connell, your points leader, 2013-2012 driver champion in his Cadillac Racing Cadillac CTS VR. Robert Thorne starts in the fifth position, got his first podium yesterday in that K-Pax Racing McLaren MP4 12C. Going back to our GTS class, now remember the grid was set by the fastest race lap yesterday, and that was Mark Wilkins from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and the PutOnTheBrakes.org Kia Motors America Kia Optima Turbo. His teammate, race winner from round number seven, starts second. That's Nick Janssen from Buford, Georgia, in the second of those Kia Motors America Kia Optima. This one with DonorsChoose.org on the hood of that Kia. Starting in the third, finishing third. Sorry, starting in the third position yesterday, Tony Bufamonte had some fuel pickup problems in his Ford Racing, Capalde Racing, Mustang Boss 302S. He'll start in third. Jack Baldwin lost the points lead to Mark Wilkins yesterday. He led by one, had some uh, fuel pump issue. The crew went to Chicago to pick up a part, got back at 3 in the morning. That reset MD, StopTech, Motul, Porsche Cayman S is ready to go. Starting in the fifth place, Jack Roush Jr., the Roush Road Racing Ford Mustang Boss 302R in the GTS category. See the guys coming down this long front stretch here. Just under start finish, they'll be passing under now. Due to this long uphill, all cars will be parked further down the front stretch, so everybody will be on the flat part of the racetrack for the green flag. And I say green flag, standing start here for Pearly Roll Challenge. So when those lights go out, we will go underway. Green flag racing for 50 minutes. Take a quick look here at our Motul race analysis. This is a four mile, 14 turn course. These drivers are set to do a 50 minute timed event here for round number eight. Your Pirelli storylines has got to be these GT3 FIA cars versus the Cadillac CTS VRs. Who's going to have the advantage here in GTS? Can those Kia Optimas front wheel drive? Asking that Pirelli P0 Slick to do a lot of work with applying the power, hitting the brakes, using the suspension. Can they last for a 50 minute all out sprint race brawl? Guys are lining up on the front stretch here. Those will and lights will turn on. When they go off, we go green. Got a lot of great stuff to give away here for all of our web viewers at worldchallengetv.com. Tune in a little bit later. I want to let everybody know that our live stream broadcast is presented by Cadillac. The back of the field is just rolling into their positions. When we do get our green flag from Rick Wong in the back, we'll get our grid set board on the front of the field. That starts the starting process. We'll get the five-second board on the side of the wall. When we get that five-second board, that starts the starting process. And once those lights go on, usually about three to five seconds from the lights on, they go off, we will be underway with round number eight. The Cadillac Grand Prix at Road America. Grid is set. Green flag in the back of the field, waiting for those wheeling lights to turn on. Revs are coming up. Safety lights are off. Red lights are on. You see them there on driver's left of your screen, waiting for the lights to go off. Evergreen underway there, and it looks like everybody got away. Great start from Johnny O'Connell in his Cadillac CTS VR. Remember, that car has trash control and launch control, but Mike Skeen, what a great run for him. Coming down in this tight turn number one as Dan Knox in the back in that SRT Street Racing Technology Viper. Great run for him. Mike Skeen, however, there is Anthony or Nick Mancuso to the inside, but Cadillac of Johnny O'Connell to the outside. Side by side as they go through turn number two. It is Johnny O'Connell up to second place. Butch Lightsinger in the Bentley back to fourth. Coming down this long hill into turn number five. It was once again Mike Skeen, Johnny O'Connell looking to the outside. That Cadillac comes in a lot quicker, a lot heavier weight. Mike Skeen to the inside. It's going to be side by side through five. Who's going to have it in the breaking zone? It is Mike Skeen sticking it there. Boy, side by side. Boy, gentlemen there looking for it. Way wide by Tim Bergmeister behind him into Andrew Palmer. Johnny O'Connell in the lead. That number three Cadillac CTS VR. Oh, backwards spin there. There's Robert Thorne, that number six, K-Pax Racing McLaren MP4 12C. Finished second place yesterday in his at McLaren. Not what he wanted to have happen. He got back underway. No harm, no foul there. But boy, Johnny O'Connell, what a great start from that guy. He goes into the lead through the carousel, turn number six. Mike Skeen behind him in that Hawk performance, Audi R8 on the heels. But remember, yeah, you saw it yesterday. Mike Skeen, that car comes in a little bit later. The Cadillacs come in a lot quicker as they come through. Probably one of the most 
treacherous corners and best corners in all of motorsports, the kink. Greg Creamer up into the booth, joining me here for that pre-race festivities we had on the grid. And boy, we're underway. How about this? Oh, it's awesome. There's no question about it. And yeah, just look at this here, this fantastic run. Once again, as you pointed out, those Cadillacs uh, with that finely tuned launch control and then the ability of that car, especially on a cool day. It's chilly out there to get heat in those tires a little bit quicker. But Skeen told me, he said, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on trying to get it to come in with the cool air the aero, the downforce that those, uh, in particular, uh, Audis in the FIGT uh, or GT3 homologation make, that downforce in this cool air is going to be exaggerated. That'll help those tires come up to temp a bit quicker, I think. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because we saw it yesterday. Mike Skeen was running third all the way back to fourth at one point. He hunted those leaders down as Andy Whoa. Pilgrim onto the inside of Anthony Nazaro. Oh, and big smoke down through here. It looks like there might be a motor failure there. Oh, Chris Outson in the DWW Motorsports Ford Mustang. Smoke billowing out of the side of that Ford Mustang boss. And, and he just spun it. I saw he's throwing some oil down, Jeff. This is going to be very dicey. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to uh, race control. Hopefully, we'll make a call out to all the teams to watch out for that because he spun in his own oil, so we know there's fluid down on the track. Yeah, those workers, you see that yellow flag with the red stripes right down the middle. That's a surface flag. I mean, something has changed noticeably in the surface. Look at this battle right here as Butch Leitzinger feeling the heat right now. Mancuso down underneath them and the Global Motorsports Group Audi as well. And up the hill they go into turn six. So, so close here. And Leitzinger decides, yeah, I'm going to let him go and tucks back in behind Palmer. Yeah. It's going to be a little frustrating. I mean, starting where he did in fourth, he has slipped back now to, by what is that, about sixth perhaps for Leitzinger? Yeah, not sure what happened with Butch there. Yeah. He did say in that, that morning warm-up there that all he wanted to do was practice doing warm-up starts. He never had done one except for, uh, you know, maybe a long time ago he told me. I think yeah. he said the last time he said he didn't stand start was like 2002 as an exhibition. Well, and, you know, the thing was, yesterday, they, they literally did not get off the line. So it's way better than what happened yesterday, and that is a result of doing those practice starts. But that's something we've seen. These FIA GT3 cars don't come with a launch control program. So the standing starts, not something you see in the European racing. And so it's just something that they, you know, uh, develop. Eventually, it happens. The McLaren struggled early with it, and now they're getting off the line quite well. It's just a matter of adapting. Yep. Got to get that set up and do practice and testing. Brand new car. They just got this here getting out there. But... Uh, Andy Pilgrim started in the eighth position. He's up to third yeah. trying to run this league group there. And there's Nick Mancuso under attack now from Andrew Palmer. Yeah, a couple of the great young gun stories of this season here. Mancuso, Palmer, both started as GTA category, subcategory drivers. And quickly, by the third round of the championship, got bumped up. Here comes Leitzinger. Boy, did he get a run on Palmer. Looked to the inside, almost like, you know, like he sold him a dummy. Palmer moved over, and Butch drove right around the outside. You're not going to get many drivers on this track more savvy and experienced than Butch Leitzinger, let alone wicked quick. Well, the cool thing, too, is being the right-hand drive Bentley when you pass the uh, Audi, you know, right like that on the on the left side. You can just reach out and give him a high five as you go by. Absolutely. And I asked Butch, I said, do you think sitting in that right seat on a track like this with, uh, with lots of right-handers, your body ballast helping? He said, I think it does a little bit. And he said, you know, there's a f number of tracks we race on there, predominantly right-handers. He said, so we're really excited about this. Yeah, you got to know if that played into the strategy of Bentley by doing the FIA GT3 homologation. Anthony Nazaro looking at the outside of Andrew Palmer down here to turn number five. Looks like Tim Bergmeister. Little Woo! touch there from that yeah. portion of the Ferrari. That was a smooch. That was just a little smooch. Close quarters racing, great stuff, obviously. And that effort racing team has come alive this weekend. That run by Bergmeister, the first podium for the team yesterday, spectacular stuff. And, uh, boy, was he racy. Uh, just had that one moment when he dove down underneath Pilgrim in five, got a little deep in on the brakes, floated wide. Palmer, that great opportunistic slice pass underneath and jumped into second. But Bergmeister, uh, yeah, I think he is relishing a car that now is well and truly competitive, Jeff. Yeah, he was happy to do that. Finally got a podium in that effort racing Porsche GT3R. Was said uh, on a radio show we did Thursday at Rinless.com, the Porsche forums. All the members there got a chance to call in and ask him, Bergmeister and Michael Mills, any question they wanted. And he said that uh, he was looking forward to this race. He thought that they were going to be really great here. He says that really suits the Porsche versus the street circuits. Not really great for their platform.
Yeah, this is what these GT3 cars were designed for. Uh, you know, initially, the smooth, high-speed circuits and, uh, you know, the rougher tracks that we have in North America, something that they need to work on. And, uh, you know, they're certainly capable of it, and they'll figure out the setup. So we've seen some pretty competitive runs uh, at Detroit by a couple of these FI GT3 cars, so it will happen. But uh, this is the track that these guys live for. Absolutely. You know? This is a track on. We talked about it in the pre-show. There's drivers that have you know, bucket list tracks they want to go to. Yeah. It's like you might have bucket list places you want to go visit, and this is probably near the top on everyone's list. I don't think there's any question of that. Uh, it's just a cool, a little bit foggy out there, but that's lifting finally. So that's absolutely great. These guys have uh, great track visibility now. The nice thing is, Jeff, these cool conditions help keep any race tire, let alone a phenomenal race tire like the Pirelli P0 Slick, alive a little bit longer. You know, these cars can push these tires. That's one of the great things about the Pirellis. But you do it too much, you push it too hard, you're going to overheat them and maybe even damage them. It doesn't matter how good a tire is made, it can be abused if it's not managed a little bit. This opens that window up a little bit, doesn't it? Especially for a team like Cadillac that tends to push those tires perhaps harder than anybody else because they got the power, so they got to carry the weight. Yeah, they add to it, and that's one of the advantages that we see early on with Johnny O'Connell and Andy Pilgrim able to go from eighth to third for Pilgrim and for Johnny from fourth up to the lead is that those tires come in really, really quick, but you have to manage that over the entire run, and that's one thing that Cadillac Racing has been really able to do, and it's something that this Pirelli P0 allows these drivers to do, that's such that great compound and great tire. One of those guys on the move, though, Butch Leitzinger, starting to get in the groove. You see him there on that monitor in that Bentley Continental GT3, Britling. Mobile One supporting this Bentley and Dyson Racing. How about that in fifth? He's getting in the groove, setting some of the fastest race laps now. The is fastest. Bush Leister, the he, fastest right now. <laughs> yeah. First car into the 209s. Huh? And how about our Optima Battery best standing start going to the driver in that Ryder Engineering Lamborghini Gallardo. Thomas Inge had a problem there yesterday. The crew literally did not go to sleep last night for two reasons. First to pick his car, but he picked up five positions on the first lap. Nice. Second, Marcelo Hahn, you saw him have that incident yesterday at the start. They brought Prince Albert von Thurn und Taxi's car over from Indy. Got here about 4.30 in the morning. He's in a different car now. Boy, talk about work for that crew. They never even went to sleep. That's impressive. And that's that's why we always talk about, you know, the drivers get the accolades. And, oh, my goodness. This is huge. Jack Baldwin, the number 73 reset MD Motul Stop Tech Porsche Cayman S. Smoke coming out of the, uh, the car. Not sure what the story is on that. We just suddenly got the shot. Second uh, in the points coming in. Always a championship contender. He has pulled off. He is done, Jeff. Unbelievable. Yeah, look at that. Yesterday had a fuel pump problem. The crew went down to Chicago. It was the only place they could find one. And they got back about 3 o'clock in the morning to get oh. that car fixed. And the, oh, my gosh. Huge. Alex Figgy, huge impact in that McLaren. Oh, wow. That was, uh, I mean, I couldn't count the number of times he pirouetted, oh. throwing up, smoking uh, dust and debris. I think, is that the exit of turn That's one? That's the exit I of think. turn, yeah, exit, yeah. Of, exit of two, I believe, coming yeah, down the hill. One, one, and then there's a station there two. really called two. And uh, that usually means that uh, something happened at the exit of one. And. Uh, you just you're going so fast one is a deceptively quick corner here and there's another car involved see one of the ferraris up yeah. there one of the our ferry motorsports i don't know which one that is i know anthony lazaro and figgy were racing together i don't want to speculate on who that second car is but huge impact from both of these vehicles yeah we are under a full course caution and uh, you know uh, this series is renowned for the, when there are incidents that can be easily cleaned with a corner station only, they cover it, they get out, they get it done. This one, you have no choice. You've got debris that is uh, throughout, uh, you know, the track area over there, and uh, this, you have no choice. You've got to go full course, especially at a track of this speed. And it looks like that is, I believe, Anthony Lazaro. It is wow. the number 61 Ferrari. And just on that earlier shot, I saw a glove come out the window, and we got the thumbs up from Anthony Lazaro. Boy, that McLaren absolutely destroyed. We're still waiting to hear about Alex Figgy. As soon as we know, we'll let you know. But huge impact there, Greg. Big, big, big. And, I mean, the number of spins that Figgy had, that's, it was all smoke coming off of those tires. As I said, that is a fast corner there. You know that, Jeff. You've raced here. Uh, you, you come through one a lot quicker than you first think when you get here, and you know, you're looking at the track map. That's a fast exit over there. Yeah, I think it took me about two sessions before I finally was like, oh, I'm, now I'm going fast enough through here. It really is a very intimidating corner. 
and uh, it's quick through there and just not sure what happened. We don't want to speculate anything, but it yep. looks like right now Anthony Nazaro did give us a thumbs up, and as soon as the safety crews are on scene, great safety team here, but uh, this is obviously going to be a little bit of a cleanup. Yeah, exactly, and uh, that's one of the great things. You, uh, you know, we talk about the so many reasons you come to Road America. One is it's got probably the best track run EV group that you were going to find in North America and augmented here by the great Pirelli World Challenge safety specialist on board the Cadillac safety vehicle that Escalade that respond immediately and know the medical histories and the like of every driver out there. Uh, it's, it's very special indeed. Right before that happened though, Andrew Palmer usurped the fastest lap of the race from Butch Leitzinger and uh, young Andrew Palmer, that number 21 Audi, uh, un uncorked one folks. It was the first sub 209 lap that I've seen at 208. Uh, nine, nine, nine. I mean, just nipping underneath it, but an unbelievable uh, lap for him. And, you know, as we watch this cleanup, obviously, you never want to see any kind of a caution, even as a driver that might benefit from it in another scenario. But mentioning that, Johnny O'Connell and Andy Pilgrim in those Cadillacs, this is going to help them immensely with those tires uh, to give them a chance to cool them down again. And that heat cycles it, it gives that tire maybe takes away just a bit of grip, but it gives it a, a smidge more durability. And then they, you know, once we go back to green, they're going to be in good shape. Here's a look at the GTS field right now, and it continues to be a Kia 1-2. And I'll tell you, Nick Janssen did what he did yesterday, Jeff. He had just gone uh, on this one, and this is going to bring the rest of the field back to him. Yeah, he sure did. He got around his teammate, Mark Wilkins, who was your pole sitter. He did that yesterday and led flag to flag. So we'll see what uh, Nick Janssen or Mark Wilkins do that. But great start from Dean Martin in that pitcher cars east. Rahegan Racing, Ford Mustang. He's up to third. Tony Bufamonte back to fourth. Lawson Oshabach in fifth in that Black Dog Speed Shop. Chevy Camaro talked to Ray Hampton a little bit earlier, and he says, man, it's just something just not right. We're trying to get going. It's We're really working on hard as we can get. Well, it was interesting. At Detroit, both races... They ended up with a shock failure, and they said, we've never had an issue like that. We've tried everything we can. We don't know what's going on. Uh, so, you know, they've just been chasing things. And this is the team that came in last year. First time those Black Dog Speed Shop Camaros turned a wheel was at the opening round in St. Pete. They proceeded to win the championship. Uh, it's a, you know, an immensely capable team with Ray and the guys, uh, Ray Sorensen and the guys there. Uh, but you know, every once in a while, even the best of teams, and believe me, that's where they rate. They hit these little streaks. and. You know, it's the perseverance. It's chasing it. That's what makes the difference. Yeah, it's uh, and they're a championship team. Oh, I yeah. think they'll recover okay. Oh, without, okay. A doubt, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. But shot. it's frustrating. It's certainly frustrating for them. You know, they're just, uh, you know, we know we're fast, and yet, you know, we just struggle. And it, and, and it's not because of a speed thing. It's other niggling little things, and that'll that'll frustrate you. Uh, nice to see Tony Buffamane, who was so impressive yesterday, and uh, and uh, then you know, right at the end. Boy, tough things for that guy, but he is so quick, and it's uh, great to have him in this championship, and he continues uh, to really be absolutely superb. Uh, and, of course, Dean Martin with what he pulled off. You're watching him right there, that picture, Cars East, uh, Mustang Boss 302S at Detroit, that double win, double pole uh, run that he put on there. Uh, you know, brought him right back into the championship. He, too, struggled a bit yesterday. He had a little bit of a problem there and didn't really know what was going on, but looks like they worked on it overnight and recovered. Said he put a dry sump oil sling system on that car, and he actually lost horsepower. Didn't find out until ready to tow over here when they ran it on the dyno just for a quick check. Wow. But you try to improve the reliability of your car, do something to you, and it ends up costing you, and there's nothing you can do about it when you're ready to leave for the track. Yeah, you're pretty much committed. And the last place you want to get to down on horsepower a little bit is... One Road America. Road America. That's Not sure. a good thing. Yeah, I don't think there's too many worse places to have that happen at than that. But looking at some of the other standings here, we haven't talked much about our GTA category, the GT class yet. But Tim Pappas won the GTA category yesterday, getting his first Pirelli World Challenge victory in that Mercedes Benz SLS AMG Black Swan Racing and Black River Caviar helping him out this weekend currently leading in our GTA category, and that gave him the points lead in the GTA category yeah, yesterday did. over Michael Mills. Second is Heinrich Hedman. That Dragon Speed Ferrari had an incident yesterday. Another one of those crews. I left the track here probably around 12.30 last night, and they were still slaving away getting that Ferrari going. Sitting in second, great run for him. And Jeff Courtney, the local boy, yeah. in his KendaRecStuff.com Audi R8, sitting in third, said they calculated just enough gas to finish the race not finish to get back to the pits, it's, just to finish, finish the, the race. race. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, ran out of gas and unfortunately missed the podium celebration yesterday. He's looking to rebound from that today so these local fans can celebrate with 
this local Wisconsin driver, Jeff Courtney, in the number 99 third in GTA. Well, it was interesting when I was talking with Andy Lee in Victory Circle yesterday. He said, he said, uh, you got to give this one to my crew. Gave me a car that was quick, was reliable, and they put enough gas in it. He said, you got to love these guys. Yeah, I mean, that was, it, that's what it gets down to. You know, and you, you know, you look at this track, it is so fast. We talk about speeds. We talk about how hard it is on brakes. Uh, these long duration corners can eat up left side tires. But the other side of it is you're on full throttle here for such long runs uh, in this, in this, on this track. It is one of the thirstiest tracks, if you will, that you can uh, find here. And you've got to account for that. You've got to up that, that calculation a little bit and go, okay, here's what we think. Add another gallon. You know? And yes, that's weight, but it's better to be a little slow early and actually see the checker than to be really quick and come up you know, half a lap short. That's just uh, not a good thing. Yeah, you don't want to have that happen. And it's all that mathematical, and that's where the unsung heroes, we talk about the crews and making that work. And that's what they had to do here this weekend. So the guy that I'm going to watch for here is Thomas Inga. He started all the way back in the number 16th place. He got our Optima Battery Best Ending Spark, picked up five position. He's sitting in eighth right now. This yellow flag is going to benefit oh. him as he's able to catch back up again. Huge. And, uh, you know, he did that at St. Petersburg where he was the, you know, the victor there in the first round outcome to the series. And really not a domination performance, but pretty close to it. And uh, when you got yeah. a good shoe behind the wheel like him, and like I said, that crew, another one of those crews that was here working overnight on that car, literally, they said we got an hour of sleep last night uh, just to get that car back underway. Well, that's the best thing a driver can do to reward a crew that has been in full thrash, wiped out mode, is bring them home with a great run. It's that simple. And, uh, you know, he certainly is capable of it. You talked about that win that he had. A little damage there in Sophronis' car, isn't it? Uh, watching that right side, and uh, it's just got uh, a piece of bodywork that's just popped off. I think it's the uh, the uh, outside of the air duct has come loose. But Enga <clears throat> qualified on pole at St. Pete in his only other appearance, totally muffed the start by his own admission, plummeted into the pack, and came back through to win it. I mean, it was uh, it was a classic Tomas Enga attack kind of race scenario, and that's what he's in right now. He was in it yesterday, too, obviously, because they gritted on points and he didn't really have any. Uh, but he got into that early incident, damaged the car, and that was it. So today, it'll be fun if he can keep it clean to watch him motor on up through the pack again. Yeah, we said it when you were talking to him down on pre-grid before we went live on our worldwide feed that, you know, those crews that he has at Global Motorsports Group and building that up, those were, <laughs> man, it's amazing yeah. when I walked through the pits last night at about midnight that everybody was working on cars and they had Safranis' car ripped apart. They changed out the steering rack on that car. They had the body panels off, did all kinds of work. And, uh, you know, really it's usually everybody else's car they got to do work to. And this yeah. time they had Safranis' car all torn apart. Well, he said, you know, we had a great race going. He was matching Palmer on times. They were really running well. He said, and all of a sudden, steering got real heavy. And uh, he said, this is not a track where you want to get behind on your steering going through a fast uh, complex. And he said, you just don't have a choice. Uh, you've got to back off just a little bit, give yourself a little bit of margin because you can't catch up and correct like you can when you're running 10 tenths or 11 tenths. The interesting story was Johnny O'Connell, you know, he said, yesterday obviously was not an ideal situation for us where we got the jump and we had to come through the pack. And he said, but from a pure driving perspective, he said, it really was, on that level alone, fun. He said, because you don't often get a race where basically it's okay for you, and the team even says, you got to do this, is to run every lap in that race as a qualifying lap. And he said, that's what he did. And you know, Johnny, he did the old, I was right here with the thumb under the chin, like on the tip of the sword through the entire race. But he was grinning when he said it. Yeah, that's cool. At least he's uh, able to recover there. And just, uh, you know, one of those things that happens, happens, unfortunately, with that. And some of those things we talk about, we've well, got the screen right there, Drew Riggetts. Yeah. One of those things, that car is up on the air jacks or underneath the hood looking at that the racers group, AMR Racing. Um, not sure what the issue is. We'll try to get a report down from pit lane. But, God, we'll feel bad for Drew Riggetts. I mean, up uh. his game here this year. We've had nothing but positive things to say. He's been in the top half of the field all season long, and sad to see a mechanical take him out. He has been impressive in how he's just committed himself to learning racecraft, speed, and race strategy. He has just been something. Steve Cameron, the engineer over there at the Aston Martin team, just said, you know, it, it's amazing. He's here way earlier than other guys. He's here way later than other guys at the end of the day, just pouring over data, pouring over video screens, looking at this. Oh, that's where I made a little mistake. And he says, you know, he's not 
got a lot of history in racing, a lot of experience. He said, but the amazing thing about Drew is he said he makes one mistake, never makes it again, and he immediately goes faster. And he just, he's a sponge. He said he, it sticks with him. That's what's so fun for an engineer to work with a guy like that. Nice. That's so great to hear. There's those little tiny stories, you know, once again, goes back to the engineers, goes back to the crews. And uh, Johnny O'Connell says it the best. I'm just the monkey behind the wheel. I'm told <laughs> what to do. Um, getting word from... Uh, race control and our safety vehicles that both drivers did get out under their own power oh, from that that's incident. So that's great to hear from Alex Figgy and uh, Anthony Lazaro. And look slow here is Michael Mills, that number 41 effort racing Porsche GT3R. He's got his right turn signal letting everybody know to go by him on there, but not sure what the issue is with Michael Mills, but slow there. Oh boy, problems, and of course Mike Mills and the number 41 effort racing GTA machine involved in that very f start line incident and ended up not running. That crew too was on a big thrash and looks like, uh, you know, you never know, but you would assume, you know, you, after an accident, you, you, you do the fix. Sometimes there's just that one little thing that got stressed that you never catch that just lets go at the wrong time and looks like Mills Day is done. What a frustrating weekend for him. Looking forward to coming here was so quick. In the, in the testing and practice sessions in the GTA subcategory, looking really strong. Came in here, Jeff, leading the points in that category, and it's now gonna leave, obviously, uh, with a big deficit. Uh, you know, he, that's the thing, a doubleheader weekend. Uh, sometimes uh, you can make up, as Dean Martin, you can make up a huge chunk, get right back into the championship, Sometimes the doubleheader weekend will really throw you under the bus, so to speak. Yeah, it really has. He lost the points lead in that effort racing team. You know, the highest of highs with Tim Bergmeister getting their first yeah, podium. That was and now the problem with Michael Mills. So it's not there. And word from the pit lane on that team uh, in the pit lane was that looks like loss of drive. So not sure when you have a gearbox full of neutrals and it doesn't go or it could be an axle. So not sure what's going on there. Half shaft, I guess, is what you call them on a Porsche. Sorry. Got to be proper. It's a half shaft. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's frustrating for sure. So... Well, it looks like uh, they're, uh, yeah, this is going to take a little while. I mean, those were two pretty substantial hits. Again, both drivers, as you said, got out. It's standard procedure. Whenever you have contact in an incident, especially if it's contact with a barrier of any kind, uh, it's a standard procedure that you always transport the driver to the medical center just for observation. And uh, that, of course, I would anticipate is going to happen immediately. Those drivers might well already be on their way. And you've got the rest of the great Road America EV group out there with the uh, wreckers, uh, all of the safety vehicles and the like, and the Cadillac safety vehicle, the Escalade, uh, out there as well uh, from the Pirelli World Challenge with our safety specialists that are working as well. Uh, and uh, you know, it'll get cleaned up as absolutely fast as it possibly can, but uh, you just don't restart a race, especially, again, we talk about how quick turn one is. You want to make sure that that piece of racetrack is in great shape and the barriers around it, you know, no leading edges, no unbanded tire that could catch a car and the like. So uh, we'll look after safety first. That's what it's all about. But hopefully it won't take too long. We'll get this one going again. Yeah, not sure what the incident happened either, too. We haven't seen a replay yet or no yeah. any details. It could have been fluid down through turn number one. Those drivers could have just been a victim of circumstance. We don't know what had happened, but it is still good news that we did hear that both drivers got out under their own power. They'll get checked out at medical, and, uh, you know, that's that's just... Yeah, that's what you want to see, and it just speaks to the that's innovations yeah. of these cars. You know, those are two FIA spec homologated cars with the Ferrari and the McLaren, and the safety additions that SCCA Pro Racing puts on the driver suits and the uniforms, the Honda devices, the side window nets. Uh, it really goes and speaks for the safety of these vehicles. Well, that's uh, you know that's a large part of the tech aspect of of this series, any series, but certainly this series is very attuned to it. Yes, you want to tech the cars for mechanical uh, equality performance and all of that, but a large part of the tech process is safety. Are all of the required safety features that are, uh, you know, supposed to be embedded into these vehicles, are they? And are they working? Are they right? Uh, because when you're racing cars of this caliber and this performance, things happen. And uh, you need to make sure that these drivers are as protected as possible. And that's one of the things that, you know, when I was down the grid and we were talking about the crews, is that, you know, the drivers, obviously, uh, you know, they get in and they're out there hustling these cars around and they deserve every ounce of, uh, of recognition that they get, but they don't go and really go after a car and, and just run it without a 
confidence that that crew's built the best safe car possible. And uh, look at that, I mean, that, uh, you know, that car right there, a lot of comprehensive damage to it, but that cell where the driver sits, totally intact. Yeah, it was uh, nice to see that. No marks at all in that center tunnel piece of the car. And there's Michael Mills getting pulled into the pits there. It'll go into the effort racing. The team will try to see if they can figure out what's, um, what's going on. And, Still getting the track cleaned up here. They're getting all the fluids that were spilled from that incident off. But, boy, that car was destroyed. There's Anthony Lazaro's Ferrari. Yeah, he obviously got the better of it in terms of uh, damage to the car and the like. Uh, but, boy, that when Figgy's car, when that thing just started pirouetting, uh, that smoke screen that it laid up. Some of that may have been, as you pointed out, there was oil and debris and stuff. When you get a hit like that, uh, it just knocks everything loose on the car. But a lot of that was just pure tire rubber because that car was spinning like a top. And uh, interesting, too, you know, I mean, obviously Nick Mancuso, uh, that was his teammate, Anthony Lazaro. So, you know, you come through that scene first time, you got your heart in your throat just a little bit. Same for Robert Thorne, who had that amazing run yesterday. And then to see team leader, really, in a way, Alex Figge, uh having that kind of a moment. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, then it's all right. They're, you know, they're okay. You just put that. Uh, that's one thing. A great race driver, uh, and, I, and I've talked to a few of them over the years, and Tommy Kendall was one who, uh, who put it once. Because he mentioned, he said, there are a couple of corners at tracks that I don't like. He said, they're just spooky dangerous. And I watched him in a race. The next time I talked to him, made two passes, second, third to second, second to first around the outside of one of those awful corners that just scared him. And I said, how do you do that? He said, well, when it's race time, you just have to compartmentalize. That goes away. That's not dangerous. You just, you've, you're in that zone. You do what you need to do. And he said, if you can't do that, you're never going to be a really, truly championship level driver uh, because you're always going to lift. <laughs> you know, and he said, sometimes you just can't, you know. Well, speaking of those championship caliber drivers, one guy that we love talking about sitting eighth right now in our GTS category. And that's the Voodoo Dat Dog. Yo! MTV Raps, Ford Mustang of Brad Adams. He's sitting in eighth. Great run for him. Yeah, it is. Great run for Brad Adams. One of the one of the greatest personalities in the Pro World Challenge paddock. If you've been to one of our races, you come to our driver autograph sessions there, you get a chance to talk to Brad Adams. Just a great personality, great guy to talk to. I can't wait till he can bring one of those Dat Dog hot dog trucks out here and be able to eat one of those things. It's like a gourmet hot dog. And I asked him once, I said, how many Dat Dogs can you eat in a minute? And he goes, I don't think you can get through one of them. These things are so great and so big. He's, there's just no way to happen, happen. But yeah, just great to see him having a good run here. Jack Roush Jr. in seventh, right ahead of him in that number 60 Ford Mustang Roush performance. That was another team that was doing a lot of work getting done. And uh, so we'll... Catch our breath here, our GT class behind the pace cars. We'll take a quick break on our World Wide Web. We'll be right back. Great to have you with us. Uh, we are still under caution uh, because of this event uh, that happened over in turn one with Alex Figge in the McLaren and Anthony Lazaro in the Ferrari. Both drivers got out of the cars as the report under their own power. Standard procedure got into the ambulance to be uh, brought into medical just for observation whenever you have any kind of contact like that. And uh, we'll update you with any further news as we get it at this point. It uh, looks like we're going to have one more lap, I think, under full course caution. was just noting the lights on the safety vehicle uh, from Cadillac. The pace car is still on as they come through Canada Corner. That usually means, yep, another lap. And here's why. Almost done, but not quite. And a lot of it is just getting that kitty litter, essentially, that they use that absorbent off of the track. Uh, it, it's phenomenal, the job it does of absorbing whatever the fluid is down there, especially when you grind it in a little bit. Uh, but if you leave it there, obviously, not a good thing. So you've got to get that cleaned off. Hopefully, we can get back to racing here in just a little bit as we still have, what, some 19 minutes? Uh, left here if we can get back to green, Jeff. Yeah, hopefully we can get back to green earlier. And during that break, we were talking about Alec Udell, the youngster. Yeah. 17-year-old having issues all weekend long. He started in the 18th position. He's up to 10th, had a slave cylinder problem. They had to change the clutch, change the transmission that broke later. Yesterday during the race, he had a rear diff problem, and that broke. He wants to have a good showing here today because it's his mom Kim's birthday. So we got to give oh, a wow. big shout-out yeah. to Miss Kim Udell. You Happy bet. birthday. I'm sure she's celebrating her 29th again. Uh, just like... You know, I do. You know, want to make sure we give a huge birthday from Pearly World Challenge out to Kim Udell and Alec Udell from 8th to 10th so far. He's starting to get in that groove and move his uh, Watson Racing Motorsports Development Group Mustang up to the front. And uh, there's another person who's having a birthday here today that uh, uh, I think it might be fun. We heard about it down on the grid uh, and we made a comment, but I know it was tough to hear up here. Uh, no less than Rob Dyson. 
is having a birthday today. So celebrating his birthday by joining the Pirelli World Challenge and bringing Bentley along for the ride. That's a good birthday. I can't think That's of a better good birthday. Good birthday there. right there, yeah. Well, maybe behind the wheel of the Bentley. <clears throat> well, yeah. That you own. Yes, exactly. So there's a Bentley. Butch Leitzinger and that Continental GT3. Went over and had a really good look at that car and talk about pristine. It is exactly as you would expect a Bentley race car to look. It looks as clean, beautiful, crisp as the, uh, uh, the street car. Four liter twin turbo V8. Makes the, it's got such a great howl when it comes by here. Just a great addition to the series. Well, we talk about that on our social media and uh, grab those cell phones and be ready. But we talk, there's been a lot of talk on social media about these Bentley Continental GT3s racing and why would you race such a heavy car? And, uh, well, when you get down to it, the car is just metal welded together. Yeah. You know, so you don't, you're not going to have motorized seats like the Cadillac has with those Recaros. You're not going to have heated seats, leather seats, motorized mirrors. All that stuff gets yanked out and ripped out of the car. So it really is just metal welded together and it's still just a Bentley Continental GT3 without all the little luxury items items like you would see in the Cadillac CTS VRs, the Ferraris, the Audis, the Lamborghinis. So it's the same type of car, and it, it matches the, the power, the yep. weight, everything there. And that's why you see a Bentley Continental able to race with the Ferrari 458 GT3 Italia. But I said grab your cell phones, and the reason for that is here is your chance to win a GoPro Hero 3 camera by texting the win. That's right. We do it every race long. If you text the word HD, just like we did at Barber Motorsports Park, so HD for high definition, text that to 313131 for your chance to win a GoPro Hero 3 camera today. John Ariola in Hawaii, I know you're listening. He got his camera last week. He was our text to win winner. He got his camera. I know he's watching live at WorldChallengeTV.com. Want to give a shout out to you. And just make sure you text HD to 313131 for your chance to win. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great opportunities here, so take advantage of that. Uh, by the way, Alec Udell apparently is absolutely committed to giving Kim, his mom, a nice birthday present with a great run today. And a proud papa texted me and said, watch Alec. He started in 18th. He's on the move. So that's absolutely fantastic. Well done. Let's go through and just sort of set things a little bit before we go back to green. In GT and overall, it's Johnny O'Connell, the number three Cadillac, leads it with the number two yesterday's winner in round seven. Mike Skeen, the Hawk Performance Audi, sits second. Andy Pilgrim, the team number eight Cadillac, CTSVR third. Nick Mancuso in the Ferrari Forest Lake. Our Ferry Automotive Group, Ferrari, number 16 and fourth. And the 08 uh, Dyson Racing Breitling Bentley Continental GT3 of Butch Leitzinger sits fifth. Andrew Palmer, the number 21 Audi from Global Motorsports Group, is in sixth. Bergmeister, seventh. Enge up to eighth. Sophronis, ninth. And Thorne is ninth. Tim Pappas. Tim Pappas is still leading in the subcategory in GT. GTA for the non-professional driver. Uh, but Henrik Hedman, who was very fast but had that issue late in the race yesterday, uh, is sitting a very handy second, literally right behind Tim in 12th. And Jeff Courtney, the uh, local favorite from Milwaukee, sits in 13th, right in the mix. And Dan Knox and Marcello Hahn. So basically the top five in GTA right now are running 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. That's going to be fun to watch. And in GTS, it is the two Kias of uh, Nick Janssen and Mark Wilkins running 1-2. Nick won yesterday, wants to double up. Uh, Mark's at second. Dean Martin in that picture car's East Mustang is third. Tony Buffamani in the Capaldi Ford Racing Mustang sits fourth, number 33. And Lawson Aschenbach, defending series champion in the number one Black Dog Speed Shop, uh, GTS Camaro, sits in the fifth spot over Andy Lee, Jack Ross Jr., Brad Adams, Mark Clennon, and Alec Udell up those... Uh, eight spots that dad was happy to tell us about. <laughs> and there is the Sunoco Hard Charger Award, and he's up eight positions. Looking to gain some more, maybe get a special award here. Yep. One to go. We're going to go green next time by. So that's good to hear. Great job from this safety crew getting those cars cleared and this track cleared as we're getting ready to go green next time by. You've been a lot of chatter right now from race control. All of the teams have to monitor the race control frequency and race control telling them, you know, it's as clean as it can get out there in turn one, but there is still going to be some of that stuff down on the track, the absorbent material, and uh, we're going to have a debris flag at turn one for the first couple laps once we go back to green to remind you, but make sure your drivers are, well, are aware of it. Tell those drivers that that first couple of laps through one, it could be a little bit sketchy out there, and uh, another just a great part of how Pirelli World Challenge and the, the, uh, the officials work with the teams on so many different levels here to make sure that these teams know exactly what's going on on this racetrack. 
Yeah, they, they actually advised all the teams on that final corner through turn one, that final lap through turn one, apologize, to run through that kitty litter, try to brush more of it off, and then you kind of get a good feel for what the grip's going to be like. You know, you're gonna go, next time you go through there, you're going to go through there at full song, not warming your tires up. Yeah, exactly, and that's, 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 that's crucial uh, to have that understanding. Field underneath the Sargento Bridge starting the uh, run for the last time at reduced speed down through the Moraine Sweep heading toward turn five. And uh, that's one of the great things about this track, isn't it, Jeff, is all of the different things that it throws at you. Uh, you've got that uh, wicked quick one. You've got a quick approach in through turn three that's downhill again. So braking becomes a, a tricky balance. Then it gets massively exaggerated when you're coming from one of the highest speed parts of the track down into turn five and it just falls away while you're braking. One little iota too deep and you're off into the runoff down there in five. It's got to be intimidating too and it's different because you mentioned it before it's a downhill so you have this long straightaway you're booking down there you get in that braking zone and you're like oh not enough not enough because now you've got the speed but then you're still downhill so gravity's going against you and physics i think goes into full effect there and uh, it's hard to really get that braking point you see a lot of guys running too deep through yep. there and running off and uh, not where you want to end your day in turn number five yeah and then if you get five right to me you get up into turn six which is one of the trickiest corners at any racetrack not one of the fastest spookiest corners but technically right as you crown that little rise into six is when you need to start braking so if you time it wrong if you go early you're just dirt slow through six and if you're that much too late you lock up and suddenly you're looking at that gravel trap out there but when you get it right and i'll tell you butch leitzinger and james weaver back in the day in those dyson prototypes those two had turn six mastered with how they were able to get through to get the car to rotate take away that understeer from being light feed it throttle before they even got to the apex. When you get it right, it's a magical corner, but one out of ten maybe if you're good. Well, I talked to Mark Wilkins, and he said, you know, that's one of the corners on this track that they've struggled with in the Kia Optimus being front-wheel drive. Oh, I bet you, they yeah. lose the weight of the front wheels over there, so he says we have to stay neutral throttle there. We're losing a lot of time to a lot of cars because of those reasons you gave. Well, it's time to get back to the absolute maximum application of physics here as the pace car is in. That Cadillac safety vehicle drops off and a Cadillac CTS VR in the hands of double defending series GT champion, the legend himself, Johnny O'Connell, bringing the field up. And look at that. He's bringing him up slow. He's got a V8 Cadillac Thunder engine under the hood of that machine. He wants to put it to good use and get a great launch with all that torque. There it goes. You saw it play out just in that little bit. We're back to green here as we have ourselves, it looks like about 10 minutes of racing to go. It is furious time. And look at Andy Pilgrim trying to come up along the outside of Skeen and make it a Cadillac 1-2 into that dusty stuff. Everybody gets through, but you can see the plumes coming out the back of the car. And Andy said, yeah, maybe not where I want to be here on the outside. But Skeen, he's going for it. Down into three. Jeff couldn't quite get it done. That slowed him up. Can Pilgrim get an exit? Well, Pilgrim needs a pounce right now using the torque and power of that Cadillac. Boy, Johnny O'Connell timed that perfectly. As you see, Butch Leitzinger going to the left, looking to get around fourth place, Nick Mancuso. Yeah, he looked at him, and then he had to tuck back in, but he got a great exit. Leitzinger's there, and it looks like Bergmeister trying to come with him as well. But can Mancuso work the outside? He's trapped. Bergmeister, no, he could not go. Oh, now he gets a little run as Mancuso, the Ferrari stepped out. They touch up into turn six. It's tricky here with one car. Now you've got two, you've got a group of four, and Inga on the gas. Boy, look at Inga right there behind that. Andrew Palmer was right up the back bumper of Tim Bergmeister, bumping him all the way through turn five and six. It's, uh, Mike Skeen to the inside. What a move by Skeen. He just out-deeped him using the downforce of that Audi, and that has allowed Andy Pilgrim to maybe get around the outside, and he does. Pilgrim slots around Johnny O'Connell, moves into second. But yesterday, when Skeen went to the front, he went away. But these caddies now, as we talked about, get the heat in those Pirellis. It'll be interesting. But look at Butch Leitzinger. He is fourth, and he is coming. That Breitling Bentley Continental GT3. Oh, it belongs in the Pirelli World Challenge. This is a 10-minute sprint race. You have this on oval dirt tracks for the trophy dash, and that's what's going on right now. Bergmeister right behind him in fifth. So we're watching this battle. Skeen, the two Cadillacs, Pilgrim and O'Connell, then Leitzinger, then a little gap. Back to Bergmeister, and then Palmer. 
Looking oh, here. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, yeah, no. But I just can't believe that <laughs> pass that Andy Pilgrim made yeah. over his teammate on the outside of the entrance of the carousel and places on the checklist of where you can pass. That's not even on your list. Yeah, that's that's one that's like, oh, really? I, I did that. Okay. And there we go. Skeen easing away just a little bit back into GTS. There's Alec Udell, who continues having a great run uh, as he as he was 10th at the time of the restart after starting back in 18th. But look at this. We've had a change in the uh, front end of things. It is still Nick Johnson leading, but Dean Martin was able to get around Mark Wilkins and Buffamani, that blue Capaldi racing, Ford racing, Mustang, down into one, trying to get down and underneath and take the eight. He does. Wilkins, points leader, started from the pole, is back in fourth. Boy, that yellow has changed things up. Yeah, Jack Roush Jr. to fifth, got around Lawson Oshbach, the number one Black Dog Speed Shop Chevy Camaro. He's on a charge trying to work his way through the field now in fifth, but it is Kia, Mustang, Mustang, Kia, Mustang, Camaro, Camaro. Boy, talk about parity and balanced performance. And there's Alec Udell up to ninth now as he's starting to run down this lead group, still on his charge through the field. And look at Jack Roush now, going to try and get a run on Wilkins. Down into turn five. Boy, it's tough, but he's got the inside. Can he? Oh, a little bit of smoke there. It looked like a little lockup maybe from Mark. And uh, not only that, now Aschenbach goes by. Or was that more than lockup, that little bit of smoke? Suddenly Wilkins is just dropping. Yeah, Wilkins, that car is not right. He looks like he's having some problems as Andy Lee will be the next one to pounce on that. And you see a little puff of smoke there on the shifts when he lets off. And usually when he lets off, that means there must be an engine problem. But don't want to speculate. I'm not going to say anything there. But, boy, yeah, Mark Wilkins definitely hurt right now well whenever you see smoke on upshifts and throttle application not on braking that's never a good sign that's for sure and look at this Tony Buffamani he has had so many opportunities of raw speed and have just had some issues in terms of opportunity luck whatever you want to call it and right now once he got around Janssen he has glommed onto the back of that picture cars East car Martin sideways moment there and you can see how he tapped the brakes so this trying at you whenever you get crossed up you hit a curb can knock the pucks off of the rotors he gives that little safety tap but boy Buffamani watching the back end of that white Mustang step out for just a minute he must have he, either he went oh this could be really ugly or oh I've got a chance yeah, I was talking to uh, Gino Lucci, the team principal there at uh, Pitcher Cars East, a sponsor on that car, and said he loved what they did in Detroit. Uh, sponsor on that car and yeah. really stepped up the program with Rahegan Racing and Dean Martin. That's a show car that they got for Detroit. Oh, and there's Tim Pappas, your GTA points leader and winner yesterday, flat left rear tire. Heading into pits, good for him. It happened close to pit lane. That's a shame, though. He was uh, really hoping. He loves this place, has always had success here, wanted to double it up. And uh, now let's see, does Bubba Bonnie have the run? He was in the toe, he was a little bit far back. So I think he just wanted to move over and show Martin that I'm here, one mistake buddy, and I'm through. I don't know that you rattle a Dean Martin too much, but you're always gonna try. Yeah, no matter what, I don't care who you are, you're gonna put your nose side to side as uh, Lawson Aschenbach getting around Mark Wilkins. And it looks like Milk Wilkins is starting to recover just a little bit there, there's five minutes to go. How about that? Oh about man. Two laps. Yep, watching as, uh, Pappas limps down into pit lane, but here is your GTS scenario here, and there you see it as Aschenbach getting around Mark Wilkins. Buffamani, again, just uh, making sure he's in the mirrors of uh, Dean Martin. Here's Jack Roush Jr. in that multicolored Roush Ford, uh, Roush Road Racing Ford Mustang boss. There, though, is Andy Pilgrim, and uh, he continues to hang on in front of Johnny O'Connell, who's got still big pressure from Butch Leitzinger. Line astern as they head down toward the kink, this is a downforce corner, and that's what these GT3 cars have. But Johnny O, he's got other attachments in that car that make him very fast through those kind of corners. Yeah, we look at the battle of luxury here, the Cadillac yeah. ZTSB know, awesome? versus the Bentley Continental GT3. Wow, this is good stuff here, watching these two guys battle it out. Johnny O'Connell, Butch Leitzinger. Boy, you talk about the history that those guys have in motorsports and sports car racing. I got to wonder what the years combined are and the amount of wins these two guys have. It's going to be a stat that I'm going to have to get for the next race, but it's going to be astronomical, I'm sure. Oh, my goodness. There's absolutely no question of that. It's huge when you start talking about those kind of numbers. You know, the thing is, is that you don't see in the shot right now is Mike Skeen, who once again has gone to the front. And look at this. Buffamani again, down in a can in a corner, showing the nose. And that time, Dean Martin defended it a little bit. And they were both a little slow out. And look at now, Jack Roush all over the back of this battle. Yeah, he got around Mark Wilkins and Lawson Aschenbach. And on a charge now on the back of this battle for a second. So it becomes oh! a three-way battle. Buffamani to the inside. 
And look at that. Dean Martin said, nah, you're going to be slow out of this turn if I can trap you down there. And he does. And Jack Roush said, you're both going to be slow out. I'm coming up the inside. Immediately, Martin goes over there. He knew that neither of them were that quick out of this corner. And they are in an absolute drag race. Roush noses ahead of Buffamani. The question is, he's now down to the inside. Is Buffamani going to be able to come up around the outside? Not close enough! Boy, Roush dancing on the brakes. I thought he might just skate into the back of Martin for a second there. Somehow he wowed that big pony up. Holy moly, how about that? You saw that rear dance a little bit, and good reference there from Pony. How about that, huh? Wait, that, that was bad. Man, really. that's, I that's, that's oh, a, I apologize. That's like Emmy Award winning right there, <laughs> I don't buddy. Know about that, man. But look at this. Now Roush looking racy, wants to take a run at Dean Martin. Martin went to the left a little bit to protect the inside line. And look at that. Buffamani just tucks up behind Roush, thinking, well, who? Who am I going to choose for this one here? Martin's got the inside, but you can make it work around the outside if everybody cooperates. Side by side still, Buffamani. Uh, oh, do I want to go with Martin? I want, uh, oh, Roush, I get, don't know. And Roush, well, look at that. Now Martin's still staying there, but Roush finally closes the door, and Buffamani thinks, well, do I have an opportunity here in the seven? No. And Aschenbach goes, yeah, keep it up, guys. Yeah, look at that, though. <laughs> Last lap by, Jack Roush was 1.2 seconds quicker than your leader, Nick Janssen, into second now. Can Jack Roush, is there enough time with about two laps remaining here for him to run down your overall leader in GTS, Nick Janssen? Boy, it's going to be exciting stuff. His white flag for your race leader it, on the start-finish straight as he comes down the straightaway for Mike Skeen. Picks it up. The official margin for Skeen as he comes by, sets the race's fast lap as well. As he comes through, he sets a 2.087, and uh, that is a great margin, 1.8 seconds officially for Skeen. So right now, the battles in both our classes, GT and GTS, are down to second. But are they battles? They are absolutely wonderful. Let's not forget now, with Pappas and that flat tire, Henrik Hedman, uh, well, he had it, but Marcelo Hahn got him on that last lap. Marcelo Hahn now moves to the lead in that zero. Blau Pharmaceuticals, Ryder Engineering, Lamborghini to the lead in A over Henrik Hedman in the Ferrari. Jeff Courtney, though, maybe another podium for the local favorite here. What a great story. Last time down into that tricky turn five, Jeff. Cadillac, Pilgrim, Cadillac O'Connell, Bentley, Leitzinger. Wow, the names that you read off there, <laughs> just a Bible and dictionary <laughs> in sports car racing as it is. Well, I'm going to head down to pit lane to do the NBC broadcast victories and victory circle celebrations. It's going to be exciting to call the end of this. Oh, it's, uh, it is. Uh, have some fun down there getting those interviews for the NBC Sports Network's enhanced coverage that will be airing in a couple of weeks here from the Cadillac Grand Prix of Road America. Here's that battle for a second. It is still Dean Martin, but Buff Amani is glued at this stage, and actually that's the battle for third. And Roush taking huge chunks right now over Nick Janssen. This is awesome what he is doing here late in the race. It'll be interesting to see what kind of a lap. His best lap was a 220.0, and the only guys down into the 19s in this race thus far, three of them, uh, Wilkins, uh, Buffamani, and Nick Janssen. But Janssen's been into the 218, so it is fierce stuff right now. All right, here we go. Skeen through turn number 13, the Billy Mitchell corner, the old Billy Mitchell bridge corner. Through turn 14, will he be able to do it? Will he pull off the weekend sweep? Up the hill, the Hawk performance, CRP Racing, Audi R8 Ultra. Here he comes, he has done it. Mike Skeen doubles it up on the weekend. Pilgrim second, O'Connell hanging on for third with Butch Leitzinger in tow. Rest of the field screaming through at this point. There's Janssen as he is working his way through the kink one last time in the lead in GTS. Yes, there's Roush. Boy, he has halved that distance between himself when he made the pass on Martin to Janssen. I don't know that he's got enough time, but boy, you know Jack Roush Jr. is never going to quit. Here comes Buffamani trying now. He's got to do it around the outside if he's going to make it work. He's on the outside of Martin and Cannon a corner. He's got a better exit line, but the back end of that blue Mustang starts darting and dancing over those rough rumble strips. Somehow he stays there. He emerges in third pod. What a move by Buffamani. Martin right there, and Martin now has Lawson Aschenbach in that black with the lime green highlights of uh, that Black Dog Speed Shop Camaro coming up the hill. Unbelievable stuff. Watch for it at the line. There's Janssen taking his second straight win. 
and Roush had trimmed that to under his second. Buffamani, what a move for third with Dean Martin fourth and Alec Udell fifth. And yes, indeed, in GTA, Marcello Hahn held on uh, for the win in that category. That's kind of been his M.O. this year. It's been pretty interesting. In the first of the doubleheaders, something goes really bad generally, like it did yesterday with that incident. And then he responds with a breathtaking drive in the next race and ends up uh, generally bringing home a win. But uh, wow, that was some great action in the last lap. And uh, Roush, he closed it up a lot more than I thought as he wound his way through that final lap. That was just immaculate. And Buffamani's move on Martin late in the going was spectacular. And happy birthday, Mom, Alec Udell from 18th to 5th. That's 13 spots in GTS alone, let alone uh, the potential for any overall spots that he may have made up. Uh, I, would, I would be massively surprised if he doesn't lock down that uh, Sunoco Hard Charger Award. Wow, fantastic stuff. Uh, Tim Bergmeister, once again, a top five finish. And Butch Leitzinger, uh, a first top five and only the second race for the Dyson Racing Team Bentley Breitling Continental GT3. Wow, this one was phenomenal. Unfortunately, we had that long caution in the middle, but boy, did it turn it into an absolute shootout at the end, and it was about as exciting as it gets. We would have loved to have just seen the whole thing go green and see what was going to unfold that way, but this was some phenomenal stuff, to be sure. Again, our coverage today of our GT and GTS race presented by Cadillac, as they are the Cadillac Grand Prix of Road America this eighth round of the GT and GTS championship. So just phenomenal. Y you know, yesterday we had a number of cars on the cool down lap suddenly sputter and stop uh, because they were cutting their fuel margin so, so close. And it looks like uh, pretty much everybody able to uh, wind their way in today and uh, bring it home. Absolutely fantastic stuff. What a great story here unfolding uh, this weekend at the Cadillac. Grand Prix of Road Atlanta. Just some amazing stuff. All right, let's take a look now at our unofficial results in our various categories and classes. There in GT, Skeen gets the second straight win over Andy Pilgrim. What a great pass on teammate Johnny O'Connell. Leitzinger, a great charge. Bergmeister in fifth once again. Palmer in the Audi. Mancuso in the Ferrari. Thorne in the McLaren. Tomas Enga, again, from uh, deep in the field, up in the ninth. And James Safronas completing the top ten in his Global Motorsports Group Audi. So uh, just some great racing. In GTS, Janssen, pretty much the jump at the start and led all the way. But Jack Roush closing it up to officially 1.019 at the end. Uh, Tony Buffamani, a great pass on the last lap in a tricky spot around Dean Martin for third. Martin fourth. Aschenbach into the top five with Wilkins and Lee, Adams and Landry, and Mark Clennon completing uh, that's your top 11 at this point a great story and then once again of course as we talked about in the uh, GT hyphen a subcategory Marcello Hahn getting around Henrik Hedman and bringing home the win well that's going to wrap up our coverage here uh, on our global web feed at world hyphen challenge tv.com thank you wherever you are for tuning in and enjoying coverage of the amazing Pirelli World Challenge GT and GTS championships eighth round of the season now in the books that wraps it up for our coverage of the Cadillac Grand Prix of Road America for Jeff Lepper I'm Greg Creamer thank you so much